Hello and welcome to um, the Quagmire. Today um, we are hosting another professor um, by the name of um, Christopher Thomas. Um, he's being interviewed by um, Paige, if you remember her from the first podcast. And say hello to everyone, Paige. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> well, um, today we are discussing so, like Simone Vale, so I guess you could say we're removing the veil on this particular topic. So introduce yourself, Chris. Hi, thanks guys for inviting me on. Oh, very happy to, to be here and very happy to see such an active philosophy society as, as well. It, it, it's great to see. Um, my name is Dr. Christopher Thomas. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, today we're talking about some of my latest work on Simone Weil but I'm very new to Simone Weil um, and uh, I'm going to give you a little, little brief biography of my kind of intellectual biography so you can uh, get an idea of, of how I came to Weil because it's definitely not a traditional intellectual biography. I, I, I studied fine art photography for my BA where I was writing a lot of art history and art theory and things like this. Uh, and after that, I went on to do an MA in contemporary art theory, modern philosophy at Goldsmiths. And this is where I uh, originally started writing or started reading Ve, uh, particularly her notion of decreation, which I know Paige is particularly interested in. Um, I wrote a, a master's thesis, uh, it was called something like on the necessity of a creative involution between Simone Weil and Gilles Deleuze and um, And I wrote that at Goldsmiths. But after that, I put Weil to one side and went and wrote my PhD on Spinoza at the University of Aberdeen under the supervision of Beth Lord, Professor Beth Lord. Um, and really and truly, I'm a Spinozist. Spinoza is, is my guy. I kind of know him in here. Um, I've read the ethics, I dread to think how many times in the, in the, in the Tractatus Theological Politicus as well, and, and uh, when I finished my PhD I returned to Ve in order to push against my Spinozism, um, because in many ways Ve and Spinoza are incredibly close on certain things, but then they're also incredibly far away from each other. And Ve is kind of my other, she, she keeps in check my dogmatic Spinozism. Um, and I think everyone needs their other. And I think it's good to work on two people uh, because it allows you, not only does it keep things fresh and it keeps your thought interesting, um, but also you, you, come across, you come across intractable oppositions, philosophical oppositions between Bay and Spinoza. And as we'll see later on when we talk about contradiction and impossibility and stuff, this is the way that thinking works, at least it is for me. Um, so currently I'm, I'm working on Bay, I'm writing a a paper and uh, a monograph proposal on Ve called The Language of Justice. I'm also writing a Arts and Humanities Research Council Networks grant for a project called uh, Simone Ve in the 21st Century Religion, Politics and Philosophy. Uh, that'll be hopefully a two year project if we get the funding um, and that will start sometime in mid-2021. Um, so I've got a few projects on Ve on the go at the minute, always writing something on Spinoza, I have something on Spinoza and Melancholy that I'm writing at the moment. Uh, but at the minute, it's, it's mainly Ve, and it's mainly uh, an elaboration of this new article that I recently published, or this public piece of philosophy that I recently put out there, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So I think that's probably enough of a, of a biography. So on page, I, I've heard you have some questions and just far away. Uh, yeah, might as well dive in. Uh, there's a couple of things in there that you just said that I might, we'll probably end up bringing up later um, spontaneously. But yeah, first off, just give us an idea of what the piece is about. Mm. Well, I wrote an article last year um, on Vey's concept of justice and its relation to affliction and uh, the intellect. Um, and off the back of that, I really began thinking about Vey's treatment of, of justice. It was really, uh, it was really directing all of my thought at the time, my kind of thought on politics, my thoughts on social philosophy, my thinking about uh, what was happening at the moment in the world. And 
at the time, if you remember, there were these uh, severe uh, demonstrations, protests in America at the, at the murder of George Floyd, and, and basically a renewed interrogation of the, of the problems of systemic racism in our society. And it was taken up in the public mind, like, it, like I hadn't seen it before. It felt like it was something different this time. It was suddenly you had the Premier League with Black Lives Matter on, on their banners, you had um, uh, the WNBA taking a knee with t-shirts with bullet holes in the back. You had real public expressions of solidarity and things like this. And of course, in, Ju in June, we had our own demonstrations in the UK um, during the middle of the pandemic, which is a very weird time to be on the street and to be active. Um, usually in, a, in kind of activism on the street, there's, uh, there's a kind of a closeness, uh, but that was difficult to get this time around. But anyway, we were on, I was out uh, in the streets in Piccadilly Gardens, as part of the protests, and I'd heard that there were, there were lots of mantras. There were lots of um, signs, lots of placards, lots of things being repeated. Um, and two of them kind of really stuck in my mind, two kind of demands for justice stuck in my mind and gave me kind of cause for thought. And of course, because I was working on VEI at the time, I had to think through VEI in order to kind of make sense of these. Um, and the first one was the claim that silence is violence. This was something that, that struck me as, it, it's a very old uh, adage in social justice movements, but I'd never really seen it in the light in which I saw it then whilst also working on VEI at the same time, because what people will know if they've read the piece is that for VEI, silence is the opposite of violence in many ways. It's a form of justice. Um, so already we had a kind of a contradiction with the demand for justice that was being made in the protest and the way that they thinks that we should go about delivering justice. But the other claim that was being made, so the, the claim that silence is violence implores us to speak up in some way and implores us to take voice. But the other claim was that white and racially privileged people should silence themselves in order to give voice to the marginalized, to the oppressed, to those whose voice has historically been suppressed and limited. So you had on the one hand the demand that justice entails uh, a form of speaking up, and on the other hand that justice entails a form of being silent. And for those of us who wanted to kind of act in the right way, we had to kind of navigate this um, potential contradiction, this potential impossible demand for justice. Um, and this resonated with me through Ve because of Ve's emphasis on uh, the, the role of silence in her theories of justice. So I basically took up, took up these issues um, and I wanted to write something public. I didn't want to necessarily go straight in and write a paper and have it to to be put in a journal and then get lost in the stacks of academic you know, journals and for no one to read it or for 10 people to read it or whatever. I thought, well, if I try to write something a bit more public, it will help me think through these things in a really clear and concise way. And it will also might bring Vey's thought to a bit of a wider public audience. And so I wrote the piece on the Philosophical Salon, which is a really good uh, place where you can read lots of public uh, public pieces. I was, it was meant to come out a couple of weeks before, um, but uh, Bernard Stiegler unfortunately died before that and there was something about him and then Zizek uh, pulled rank and got in there before me and the editor put him in front of me. So it actually came out quite a bit after the, after the events, which was a bit annoying because it had lost some of its kind of relevance as it were. But nevertheless, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was useful for me and I hope that it gave people uh, a, a few concepts through which to think about the things that were being asked of us at the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I just wanted to check, but I've got um, a question about silence is violence. Like, what exactly does he mean by that? Like, what exactly? Because it sounds like something that can be interpreted in many ways. Like, what exactly does he mean by silence is violence? Well, they doesn't think that. 
They think it's the opposite of that, in fact. They think that silent, silence is a form of justice. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Um, the claim that silence is violence is a claim that is very good in terms of putting on a placard because people can really understand if they say, well, if you're complicit in not, con uh, in not um, uh, speaking out against the injustices that you see, then that silence is a form of complicity in that injustice. Mm. And therefore it's a form of structural violence against you know, um, these things. The question of what they mean by silence, I think is, is gonna come up again later on in the questions that, mm. that uh, the page asked, because it, it's, it's, it's really the central question. What does what they mean by silence? So perhaps we can, we can let that come organically because it's a big question. I mean, it's not really something to be silent about, but um, Paige, do you have any questions? What's your next question? Uh, yeah, okay, uh, that was great, thanks. That was a really good um, overview. We are going to get, so the questions are coming, we're going to get into the meat of the concepts and stuff you're talking about, but just in case the audience or Aram or Harry aren't really familiar with who Simin, uh, Simin, Simone Ve <laughs> was as a philosopher, because a lot of people aren't, I was just hoping you could give us a bit of an idea of what kind of philosopher she was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's a really good point because they, until recently, has been, um, again, one of these kind of historically marginalised philosophers, partly because she's a woman, um, but partly also because she is very difficult in her methodology and also in her, um, in her religious convictions, which obviously we can talk about a bit about later, maybe. Um, what type of philosopher was Faye? Faye is both the most and the least philosophical philosopher that you will read. Really? She, she's both the most philosophical insofar as she is asking truly philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. um, she is incredibly well read in the history of philosophy. Um, and she's the least philosophical insofar as she tears up the rule book of philosophical methodology. Uh, how do we go about answering philosophical questions? Well, they doesn't necessarily um, uh, doesn't necessarily follow the uh, the normative prescriptions of how one might go about uh, writing philosophy. I mean, to give you an idea, um, but they they was not only a uh, a philosopher. Of course, she was a she was a social activist, probably more than anything. Um, she was a mystic. Um, she was a theologian in many ways. Um, but all of these things are bound up together with her. So for instance, when they was, um, I was teaching Plato's Symposium last week, uh, if you remember it from Death, God and the Meaning of Life. Um, and it was incredibly difficult, I thought, to teach. I always find that text really difficult. Um, but I recently found out that when they left Paris in 42 or 41, something like this, um, she went down to Marseille before she went to, to New York. And when she was in Marseille, she wanted to, uh, you know, they were very interested in understanding working class struggle by working with the working class people or work, working with the oppressed and the afflicted and so on. So she went down and she worked, wanted to work as a farm labourer. And, and of course, most of the farms in the south of France are vineyards. So she went to work on a vineyard of a... Um, uh, I believe of the Catholic writer Gustav Tibon. Um, and whilst she was working in the vineyards, doing hard labor, really, really difficult work down in Marseille, it's very hot down there. Um, she would keep a copy of the symposium in her back pocket and she would attempt to teach it to the other workers on the farm whilst they're picking grapes. So, you know, they is doing this hard labor, which is informing her own philosophy of labor. Hannah Arendt, for instance, said that they's philosophy of labour was the only genuine philosophy of labour out there. Um, and uh, so she's doing this hard labour and she's trying to teach the symposium, Plato's philosophy of love, to the workers in the fields next to her. So that is the kind of the bounding up of her social and uh, of her kind of social activism and her, and her philosophy. She's also more explicitly a Christian Platonist. That's the kind of philosopher she is in many ways. Um, she read the Bible as a kind of social philosophy grounded in the everyday suffering of human beings. And this is what she means by 
developing an incarnated Christianity, a Christianity that is essentially a materialism. She gets this from her reading of Marx. Um, she's also a philosopher who introduced anti-philosophical currents in her thinking, um, most notably notions of contradiction, notions of mystery. She put mystery at the kind of the center of her, of her, of her, of her philosophical work. Um, she thought that at the center of philosophy was a fundamental contradiction and that it's this fundamental contradiction in the very nature of philosophy which drives it in many ways. Um, the fundamental contradiction is, if I can maybe try and, it's that uh, all philosophical work is a reflection on value, but all value requires detachment. And so one has to be detached in order to do philosophical reflection, but to do this, one must already have ascribed detachment with the highest of all philosophical values. So we have a fundamental contradiction before we even begin to do philosophy. So she writes contradiction and she writes uh, impossibility into the definition of philosophy to begin with. Um, she's also a historian of philosophy. Plato, Descartes, Kant are her main figures she draws on. Um, she's anti-systematic, obviously, because she's a mystic in many ways. So if you try and draw a system out there, you're going to get tangled in knots. She also thinks that as soon as you get a system, you're going to stop thinking um, because the system is kind of closed. It's not really open to uh, the vicissitudes of material history, which change around you. Um, and yeah, that's probably what kind of philosopher they was. That's probably enough, actually. So how does that idea of like uh, is says that she's anti-systematic? That must clash quite strongly with Spinoza because he is quite systematic, isn't he? It's the most systematic. You know, Spinoza has a closed system in many ways. Everything refers to everything else. Everything is absolutely intelligible for Spinoza. There's nothing that isn't intelligible. The possibility of understanding um, or the possibility of knowing everything is there in Spinoza. But for Vey, the possibility of knowing everything is not there. Mystery is important for her, that there are things which are unknowable. Um, and she would say to, you know, you know, they read Spinoza, uh, we know this, and some people argue that they is, or at least there is one or two papers that argue that they is very close to Spinoza. Um, but I, I really don't think she is. The only thing that they have is a radical reconception of God. And if you read them both through Marx, they're both materialists. I'm not inclined to necessarily believe either of those, but that's what some people say. Um, but you're right, Vey is in many ways an anti-Spinoza and uh, where Spinoza wants to make God and the world absolutely intelligible, Vey wants to retain God as something uh, unknowable and which something that only faith can come to. Um, Spinoza, of course, has his own conception of faith, but it's a social conception of faith. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are, I mean, interestingly as well, the relationship between Spinoza and Vey and their Judaism is very important as well. Spinoza is probably the most famous of the Jewish philosophers, but who also isn't a Jewish philosopher. He was, of course, famously excommunicated by the Jewish community. And his own relationship to his Judaism is fractured and fragmented. Vey's relationship to her Judaism is very fractured, very contested and very problematic. Vey's potential anti-Semitism is difficult to think about. Yeah, um, I'm curious about Ve, um, about a concept of like mystery and stuff. Like, could you say that he was influenced in any way by like H.P. Lovecraft and his like Lovecraftian horrors, like beings that simply cannot be comprehended by like, humanity? Do you think there might have been like some influence from? I don't like, think. Fiction? Yeah, I don't think Ve was reading Lovecraft. Um, particularly. I think we should all read Lovecraft, by the way. Um, but I don't think they was reading Lovecraft. And in fact, I don't know, I can't bring to mind, when was Lovecraft writing? I think, I think it might have been just before Vey's time, like... Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't work out the history in my head now. I'd need to go back and look at Lovecraft. But um, I don't think there's a direct connection that I've ever read. They was very much embedded in the literary world of France at the time. Mm -hmm. She had a very, very difficult relationship with Georges Bataille. Um, Bataille said that Vey was the only person he was scared of. And if you read, if you read The Blue of Noon, which is Bataille's 
Bitai's other most famous book after uh, the list Histoire, the story of the eye, story of the eye. Um, uh, the protagonist, what's her name? I've forgotten the protagonist's name. Is based on Ve, um, mm-hmm. and based on Ve's uh, strange relationship to her body and her sexuality, which of course is what Bataille would be taking up. Uh, and of course, Camus as well took up Ve and said, uh, and Andre Gide and other writers at the time. So she was well known amongst and T. S. Eliot amongst the literary world, but I don't know if there's an explicit link to Lovecraft there. Um, I'm curious though, like, what was like Faye's relationship with her body, and how does her like philosophy does it contribute at all to like philosophy of the body or not? Like, what was her relationship overall? Yeah, uh, again, a, a fantastic and, and, and difficult question mm-hmm. um, because, as some people know, as, as Paige knows, Vey dies died at the age of thirty four through a mixture of self-starvation and tuberculosis. Um, Whether Vey's self-starvation was a form of protracted suicide is a matter for discussion. Essentially, Vey was refused to eat anything more than her comrades in occupied France at the time. She was in London at the time. She'd gone from New York, uh, where she had left her the invasion of, uh, of the Nazis in France. And then she left New York to go to London to be closer to the Free French Movement, to do work for the Free French Movement. Um, she wanted to be parachuted back into France to do proper resistance work as well, but Charles de Gaulle wouldn't allow it. She had this bizarre letter that she wrote to Charles de Gaulle saying that she had a plan to, and this is not a lie, to uh, dress up all these Free French Movement people in the clothing of nuns and parachute them into uh, occupied territory to, to carry out this mission. She wrote this to, to de Gaulle in a very sincere letter. Um, but she, she was in, so yes, yeah, she, she was in uh, London um, doing work for the Free French Movement. Uh, while she was there, she wrote this book called The Need for Roots, which was published, which was commissioned by the Free French Movement. Um, and she was working incredibly hard. She was sleeping three hours a day and writing constantly. Most of the output that you see from Vey, whether it's her, I don't know if I've got it here, yeah, look, whether it's her notebooks, which are this thick, were all written, I think, in the last, pretty much the last couple of years of her life, um, the majority of them anyway. So it was incredibly, um, uh, she was working incredibly hard, refusing to eat any more than her occupied comrades in France. And this basically led to the de- deterioration of her health and her eventual death at the age of 34, which is a very worrying age for someone like me. Um, so her relationship to her body was platonic in lots of ways. She was trying to escape it. That's, a, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't, I don't know. I don't know. That's a really difficult, but you know, biographical detail where biography meets philosophy. Of course, you know, as you all know from the Phaedo, you know, the, the job of the philosopher is to learn how to die, um, and they learn a little too well in many ways. I mean, it's very early, but I guess that is like you know, the best way to die to die fighting against the forces to be to die fighting against. The Nazis to die in resistance in, in a way that's, um, though it may be very tragic, like it's at the same time, would you not say it's like very, it's a very good way to die? To die yeah, fighting. I mean, it, there's a sense in a philosophical abstract sense, mm-hmm. if we, if we, if you know, if we are to believe, you know, Socrates and the Phaedo and so on, it's a good way to die. Mm-hmm. But I also would have liked to have seen what they would have done had she continued to live to see the end of the war, to continue to write uh, and produce more volumes of work and so on. Um, I think it was a loss, you know, um, but it couldn't have been any other way. That's my spinicism. But it's difficult. It's a really difficult point. And it's the point at which biography meets philosophy. And, um, and you know, whether you're dealing with someone like, I don't know, Heidegger's Nazism, or whether you're dealing with Faye's relationship to her body and her philosophy you're you're trying to extract 
philosophy from my lived experience. And of course, as we know from the true philosophers, these are inextricable. Yeah, um, it's so weird to hear you talking about that. The idea of the way she died as some kind of suicide. I don't know, it's never how I've sort of viewed it. It was just, she let her own philosophy involve too much in her own life. You know, she took aestheticism too far mm. and tried to overcompensate for people around her who weren't doing the same thing. And it, it killed her in the end, but mm. not, not suicide. I think suicide would completely contradict with vain. I mean, contradict, yeah, but yeah, <laughs> the, the kind of philosophy she does. I think you're right. I think, I think that when I said a, a strange kind of protracted suicide, I definitely didn't make it mean suicide in the, in the, in the traditional sense. Um, but uh, it's certainly, you know, there would have been an awareness of her that what she was doing was killing her. How could you not have that awareness? If you're dying, you know you're dying as far as I'm aware. Uh, and she would have become increasingly weak and opening herself up to, um, uh, to you know, death basically. So it's, it's really difficult and I don't think we have a vocabulary which is useful for talking about it. We need to invent some new ideas to talk about the way the way they died, basically. Yeah. Mm. So I think you're right. I think it's we can't really use that term properly. Mm. Yeah. Weird area. Mm. Just whenever you're talking about this in weird territory. Isn't yeah, it? basically, yeah. yeah. Not quite sure what you're talking about. Absolutely, um, yeah. Did Harry or Aram have anything else that you wanted to add on to that? Sounds like she was mentally ill, you know, it sounds like she she, she, she needed help, you know, like... Uh, yeah, like absolutely. Again, there's, there's, there's literature, there's literature which tries to give a retroactive diagnosis of what they may have been suffering from. Um, again, you know, the forms of eating disorder, uh, forms of um fatigue which she held up as a sign of goodness as it were you know she held up suffering as a, 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 a pinnacle of of human achievement in many ways um and of course you know a belief in that led to her suffering and her suffering went a bit too far and we can see you know if we if we read you know modern diagnoses of these sorts of things we can read back lots of potential um, illnesses into her. Um, I don't know how useful that is, but it's definitely something that people do try and do. It's not something that I've read too much about, to be honest. I'm curious, I'm sorry to cut you off, but um, curious because um, one thing that we can use to assess whether philosophy is, va uh, philosophy is um, valid is see how it performs in the real world and stuff. Like when we actually apply these ideas to people, see if they function well, like surely uh, because of Vey's um, death or whatever, like early death, I arguably Q to her philosophy. Doesn't that kind of show that her philosophy is somewhat flawed when actually applied to the real world? I don't think they would think it's a problem that her philosophy is flawed, um, if that's what you, what you want to say. If I understand your question correctly, is it kind of suggesting that, you know, they should have thought that her philosophy could have done, or that she could have done more on a social and political level if she'd continued to live and in that sense she wasn't enacting her own philosophy properly yeah in a way yeah i mean that's the contradiction at the heart of the hey you know is that you know on the one hand suffering and, uh, and and these things are to be held up as something which is a pinnacle of human achievement in many ways mm -hmm. and on the other hand one is unable to really help properly when one is suffering um, and so they had to uh tread that line of using her kind of middle class privilege in order to allow herself the space to help and to write for the benefit of humanity, whilst also showing solidarity to those who are suffering and affliction through making herself suffer and through making herself become afflicted, which of course will have undoubtedly um, limited her capacity to act in the world in, in, in the Spinoza's language. How is uh, suffering the height of human achievement? I think this might come up later again. Um, but Vey essentially thinks in her form of incarnated Christianity that Christ's suffering is the pinnacle of the ethical action. 
Christ's suffering on the cross. Um, that's, this is why Vade's Christianity is a, potentially a materialist Christianity, because we, we shouldn't hold up God as someone to approximate in terms of our um, trying to be like someone, in terms of our trying to imitate an exemplar of human life. Rather, we should hold up Christ's suffering. Uh, Christ's resurrection, Vade doesn't really care for this. She's not really interested in the resurrection. What she's interested in is the suffering that he went through on the cross. The fact that he called out against God. The fact that Christ is a fallible human being who, who, who came close to losing faith when he called out against God. They is interested in that kind of incarnated form of uh, Christianity in the material world through suffering. So she's advocating self-harm? No. She thinks there's, there's enough things out there which make us suffer, which negates the need for us to harm ourselves. Um, and so we don't need to go about to actively harm ourselves. You know, there's plenty out there that will harm us for, for that. We just need to approx we just need to come to that form of suffering in a particular from a particular angle. Mm. We, don't, we, don't, we don't have to invent suffering, right? The world is full of it. Mm. We just have to approach it in the right way in order to make of it an ethical demand. So it's kind of like um, a Bobby Sands type of deal. Like I don't know if um, have you heard about the anti h block protests like in Ireland, like, where um, Bobby Sands and like his hunger strike. Okay, go on. Um, like if you do, if you research into like Irish political history, basically what happened was, um, because of like the rights of like prisoners and stuff, he actually went on like and prison labour, especially for like political prisoners, he went on a massive like hun like hunger strike for like fifty five days without eating. I think it was and. Yeah, he eventually like died and stuff, but his death kind of resulted in massive like political change. Like, do you think a struggle kind of like that is very similar to what they would support or propose in her philosophy? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a history of of hunger strikes, and there's a history of the efficacy of hunger strikes for political action and so on. There's a history of self-sacrifice for political yeah. movements. Um, Vase was never explicit. And at the time of Vase's death, she probably wasn't as well known as she is now. So it wouldn't have had that much of an impact um, in the same way as someone like Bobby Sands may have. But the thinking around that is certainly something which you have to, uh, which you come up against immediately when you start to read about Vey's philosophy and her biography. And the problem with, one of the problems with Vey is that whenever people, and we've, we've fallen into it now, right? We always, we fall into talking about Vey the person, Vey the, the biography, because her biography is so extraordinary. I haven't even touched upon, you know, a, a, a minute detail of it, um, but it's so ex extraordinary. Um, and the problem is that Vey the person takes over from Vey the philosophy. And for Vey, that would be horrendous. You know, the person is something to be evacuated. We don't want to care about the person or the self or subjectivity. We want to get rid of that. Um, so they would be uh, horrified the fact that we talk about her rather than her ideas um, in many ways. Um, and if we were to, if so, to draw that back to what you just said, you know, if we were to talk about a certain political movement um, and we were to remember her name rather than the demands of the movement, she'd be quite upset, probably. Isn't there something contradictory about that suffering thing? Because, like, Christ died on the cross to, like, expiate for people's sins because Christ wanted everybody to, you know, he wanted to bring about the kingdom of heaven. And, like, un like the, in the kingdom of heaven, there wouldn't be any suffering. So, like, if we and, all, and everybody, if we all end up in heaven, then there's no suffering. And how can suffering be the pinnacle of human achievement if we're trying to bring about a state where there's no suffering? I suppose I was a little bit too loose with my words when I said it's the pinnacle of human achievement. But, you know, they, they's, like I said, they's Christianity is, is, is a form of materialism. She's not really interested in justice as it, as it pertains to the evacuation of suffering in heaven. She's interested in how we can manifest justice in the everyday world where people suffer where people die, where people undergo great affliction and great hardship. Um, and she, she will draw upon 
those material forms of suffering in order to think through uh, the relationship between suffering and um, uh, and human life, essentially. Um, so, but, but if there's a contradiction, they're fine. <laughs> that's 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 very that's very all over. Yeah, so I just not think it's one of those. No, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. It's... No, I was. It was just a comment, really. It just it amuses me. Uh, when any philosophers do this, when they put something in their work with a sort of contradiction that lets them get away with anything, <laughs> she can just say what she wants and say, well, yeah, well, contradiction is just, it's just how it is, so. <laughs> yeah, there's, there is always a get out clause in a lot of philosophers' work, isn't there? Like, um, I'm curious, Paige, do you have any more, like, questions and stuff? Because, like, I've yeah. so there much to ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was going to ask this one now, but I think I'll ask it a bit later, just because it might make sense once you've gone through all the wacky and amazing alien stuff. Um, I was hoping you would elaborate on attention and contradiction. You've talked about contradiction a bit already, but not really attention. Um, mm. Just as you have done um, in the piece, in relation as well to social injustices, but also just what they are because it's not contradiction and definitely not attention in the way that we think about it or in sort of general conversation and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely okay so attention is there There are maybe a handful of concepts in Bay which she returns to and which she draws upon and which can be said to mark her philosophy you know in the same way in which for Spinoza we have you know the affects or substance or whatever for Bay we have decreation, attention, love in the void etc. Attention is, what is attention? In the vernacular, attention means something which we pay to someone. It has a kind of an economic parlance. Um, when we pay attention, we try very hard according to the will to just give ourselves to our person, but what direct, to, to another person. But what directs that is the will of the person who tries to do it, right? One can't pay attention if there isn't uh, a, a a subject from which that attention uh, comes from almost. They think that attention, they develop the concept of attention, which allows her to, or, or, or which she says, allows you to have a pro proper ethical relation with the other. Um, and in they's concept of attention, you get the complete evacuation of the will. Um, so one doesn't, one, in a kind of, in, in a paradoxical way of how we would usually will ourselves to attention, in they we can only attend when we renounce the will. And of course we're willing all the time. Um, so it's a very difficult thing. But what that means is that means that attention comes through an evacuation of the self, through a kind of um, negating everything that makes you, you, uh, in order to allow the subject of attention, the person you're attending to, to emerge on their own terms. So the idea of attention is to allow affliction and suffering to speak. And one can't allow affliction and suffering to speak if one brings their own discursive parameters to bear on the person or subject that one is trying to attend to. Um, and this is why it's bound up with the concept of justice because in order to be just, one has to attend, one has to, one has to uh, hear, hear the injustice in its own terms. And we can't hear injustice in its own terms if we bring our own discursive practices to bear on it, if we bring our own language to it, basically. This is also why she has a critique of rights as well, because rights, the way rights articulate injustice is they do it through the parlance of middle values. They do it through the very systems that are contributing factors to forms of injustice. Um, and so you never get outside of justice. You never allow the afflicted to speak on their own terms. But in attention, in this kind of evacuation of the self um, through negation of the will and so on, you allow the other person to speak. You are kind of porous to them as it were. Um, and they, in many ways, take voice through you. Um, so that's a kind of a snapshot of attention. It's, it's, it's complicated. And, and difficult, I think, to put into kind of a, a precise um, formula. So if you're standing back to let the other person develop, then what about your own development? Like, um, 
That's uh, a very, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think that I think that they thinks that one will develop by evacuating yourself of kind of your personal aspects. So you know, in attending to the other, you will be um, growing as a person, but paradoxically, you'll also be diminishing yourself as a person. And this is the key. This again, this is a contradiction, the paradox, which is in in Vey's, in kind of Vey's philosophy. So if, if we think, you know, think of it like this, um, Vey often uses the, the, the analogy of a lever. In order to grow as a person, one needs to somehow diminish the self in the same way that you raise a lever by pressing down on the other side. So that's the paradox she always uses, right? That you grow through diminution, you grow through abstraction, you grow, grow through taking away through subtraction. Um, and this is also bound up with her notion of decreation, which I know um, Paige is looking at at the minute, because decreation is a, a way that you create through decreating, de through taking away. So like, um, I don't know if, um, correct me if I'm completely wrong, but it's like, um, let's say, in like an analyzing like a political situation, like Black Lives Matter and stuff, like, completely detaching your own like personal uh, biases or thoughts and just instead looking at the situation completely objectively is that kind of like what he'd yeah. be saying how it would apply to like you yeah know. i think that there's a sense in which that's right they never really use the term objectively um because one might attend to a situation there might be lots of people attending to a situation and they in that situation may be different to each of them so there's no singular way of of understanding the situation as it were but you're absolutely right that the 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 the, the very to, to be really really reductive you know they think you need to be completely detached um and this is again like we may come into it later when Paige asked me about Paige's relationship to the third critique um but the evacuation of the self is, is, is being completely disinterested in what one attends to, but also still retaining some sort of uh, some sort of proximity to it. You know, you can't be so disinterested so it's such that you don't contribute. Um, but it's a yeah, it's 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 a difficult thing to try to explain. I think she herself struggles to try to put into language what it means. Um, Stuff. But yeah, you're right, basically. I think in, like, if, if everyone did that, like, if everyone did that, let's say, in ancient times, then I would, I'd argue that we would have reached, like, progress, or at least where we're at today, although it's not perfect, we would have, re like, reached this point, like, way earlier, because a lot of the times people, you know, they judge a situation based on their own personal biases, their own, cult like, cultural biases, but essentially what they're saying from... What I can gather is that if we completely detach ourselves from that, then we get a much better like interpretation of the situation. Mm. But crucially, this isn't like an abstract, rational objectivity. It's not a there is a truth of the situation such that if we reason, we leave aside prejudices and beliefs and we all come to a common understanding of the thing. Um, because the intellect doesn't have a role in, 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 in attention. The mm -hmm. intellect and the will are kind of left behind because the intellect cannot, cannot approximate suffering. It cannot, it cannot begin to articulate or do anything with suffering. Mm -hmm. As Vey says, the intellect comes up against suffering like a fly comes up a pane of glass. It can see it, but it can't get to it. There's something which stops it. But attention is something which, because it's out, in many ways outside of the the order of necessity outside of the order of what they call gravity, it, mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the pain of glass, it can kind of go through that, basically. So yeah, crucially, it's not that kind of rational objectivity that you'd get in someone like, maybe like Spinoza, who would say, there is a way in which to understand this situation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we can do it if only we reason hard enough. Um, it's, it's not quite like that for me. So if, uh, um, yeah. oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. You let me go last time. No, no, you uh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
please just speak. I, I was just gonna say if you got if so if they like completed her her idea of like emptying the self, and she emptied herself of everything that she could empty herself of, like what would be left over like in her imagination? Yeah, I mean, yeah. What what would that look like? I mean. I, Maybe that's a, a limit point. Maybe they emptied herself entirely and ended up dead. You know, maybe that was the point at which her process of decreation became total. Um, it's probably not best to think about it as a, as a point in which we could get to. I think that would be what they would probably say. Um, there's no point at which you could be totally decreated or, to or, or have an, a total attentive relationship to the other. It's more like a practice that one enters into continuously because one can't help but have a self and have a person and one will always have that and so one will need to always orientate themselves towards the attentive relation whilst never being able to get there never being able to fully get there anyway um so i don't i think she'd say there's never an end point but it's always a process of a, a practice of orientation mm. yeah i'd say I mean, I don't know if you'd agree, but it's it's a process of becoming. I mean, that's what decreation is. It's the destruction of the current self, but in that destruction, it's creating another self. And that's just a continuous cycle. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's how I view it, especially with the research stuff I'm doing. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, Absolutely. You're, you're right. It's, it's a process. It's an ethical mode of orientation in the world. Um, and again, it has to be carried out in this world. You know, they, again, is... Is, is, is only, you know, even though Vey is a mystic, uh, even though Vey is a Christian uh, philosopher who believes in a transcendent God, her philosophy is bound to this world. Everything, um, you know, she reads the Gospels um, as a kind of conception of human life rather than a conception of a transcendent realm or something like this. You know, everything is written through how we, how we become in this world rather than how we ought to be by looking at a world in which we might get to eventually, you know, in heaven or whatever. Um, it's, it's this fragmented, uh, fallible, material world of suffering and sin and these sorts of things. This is what they is interested in. If she's concerned with this world, in what sense is she a Platonist? I was literally going to ask the exact same question, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic question. Um, and it's, it's a quite, I mean, uh, in what way is she a Platonist? Well, we all know how Christianity takes on certain metaphysical structures of Platonism. So we know in that sense, the fact that she's a Christian means that she has a, has a kind of platonic structure, a kind of metaphysical structure. Um, but we also know that her Christianity is a form of incarnated and materialist Christianity, where she's, where she's concerned with the Christian life in this world. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't have the form of the good and the form of the beautiful and things like this to which she wants us to try and approximate. Um, but it does mean that we have to look for those things or orientate ourselves towards those things within a life that we can't or we shouldn't seek to emerge from, I think. Uh, we should kind of, and this is, you know, this is again in her, perhaps what she gets from Spinoza. There's a necessity to human life such that it is bound to the world. Um, and she takes that as directional as being somehow crucial to, to orientating her philosophy. I mean, she reads Plato as a mystic as well. So she does lots of strange things with Plato um Plato in many ways can't be a mystic because everything is completely intelligible and it should be through the theory of the forms but they also somehow managed to to to, to read him as a, as a as a mystic so she she's got a very bastardized Platonism in many ways um in the way that she's got a very bastardized Christianity according to some Christians um but they is but yeah I mean she, she she's she's returning to the ancient Greeks in, in most of her work um, because they have certain concepts and ideas that she thinks um, are not uh, are not visible in basically the, the philosophers that are surrounding her. I'm, literally, I'm reading this at the minute actually 
some, there's an essay in here on Pythagoras, um, but um, Vais, you know, wrote huge amounts on uh, on the ancient Greeks, the Republic, and uh, the Symposium, etc. Uh, God in Plato, which I haven't actually read. That, actually. It's one of the essays that I'm reading at the minute. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's, confu it's confusing. I'm not sure I can give a better answer than that, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm curious though. Um... Why is she like you know Christian? Like, what did she see? Like, do you know why Simone Weil based her philosophy on Christianity in particular? Was it in particular? Was it because, like, you know, she was raised a Christian, or like what? Like, why does she base her no. philosophy on Christianity in particular? Yeah, no, absolutely. Weil was not raised a Christian. She she was raised as a secular ethnic Jew. Um, uh, and her Christianity came about uh, ooh, probably around about your age, I imagine, I'm guessing anyway, um, because they had two or three mystical experiences. So they was a, was a, a secular Marxist for many, many years, um, although highly critical of Marxism. Um, and then she had two mystical experiences, um, and I think a third as well, and suddenly they became a, a Christian, basically, uh, but a very particular type, um, which is probably unique to her in lots of ways, and had a problematic relationship to the church as well, despite her kind of Christianity, you know, refusing to take baptism and so on and so forth, and not thinking that, 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 that she was worthy of the, the church in lots of ways, but also highly critical of the church's um, institutional, institutionalization of Christianity, it's evacuating Christianity, it's communist and socialist grounds, um, it's implication in French colonialism and colonialism more broadly and imperialism. Um, so she's very critical of it whilst also taking on a huge amount of, of, of it. Like, what, what do you mean, what would like these mystical experiences be? Would they be maybe experiences brought upon by like stuff like psychedelic substances or? No, she wasn't dropping acid. Okay. She was, she, she, she was, she, I think she went to Portugal. Was it Portugal? And went to a very, very small fishing village. Uh, she saw a procession um, and of, of, of peasant women uh, singing and it was a Christian procession. Mm -hmm. This was her first mystical experience where she was overcome with uh, the, the presence of the divine. Mm -hmm. The second mystical experience was where was it? I can't remember where it was, but it was on upon hearing uh, the recitation of a medieval Christian poem called Love. Paige, can you remember the poet? Do you know that? I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't remember the poet. You don't remember it, I don't. <laughs> no, sorry. It might have been someone like George Herbert or someone like this. Um, uh, uh, yes, and she heard this, this poem being repeated um, and she fell to her knees, had, had a very, very strong experience with this. And then after that, she would repeat this poem, repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Just like she would repeat the Lord's Prayer in Greek as well, in order to kind of develop um, uh, the conditions for mystical experiences. But I think the, those, those two, which were kind of uncompelled, as it were, were the, were the main ones. You said that she's an unconventional Christian. Uh, does that extend to our idea of God as well? Well, absolutely. I mean, again, as, as Paige will know, her concept, her kind of creation theology um, is, a, is a concept of, or is a theory of God's creation that sees him evacuating himself in order to make human beings. Um, and that in order to return to God, his being, which we have, we're only borrowing being, according to they, we borrow it, we don't have it. We need to decreate ourselves in order to give God back the being which he gave to us. And so there is a kind of an imitation um, in decreation, but that also means that there is a sense in which, you know, this is where they, you know, could potentially become like a pantheist in many ways. There is a sense in which, because we are God decreated, that there is just you know, we are parts of God in many ways. Um, and, you know, of course, that's Spinoza. Um, so it's a very unconventional concept of God. 
um, and it all relies upon that notion of creation as decreation, um, as God's giving of his being, almost as a gift. That links back to a question I asked before about, like, if, if she succeeded in emptying herself out totally, then what would be left over? Because you said that we borrow a being from God. So what is it that's borrowing God's being? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what is that? That's, so. Yeah, I mean, I, the ultimate good in many ways for they is the giving of freedom. And that's what God does in creation, right? God reduces himself, reduces his absoluteness as being as such in order to give human beings their freedom. We are free. And this is also what Vey is doing in her ethical philosophy, right? In order to attend to the other, we are diminishing ourselves in order to give the other a sense of freedom. Um, we're reducing our, uh, uh, we're reducing our presence, if presence is understood as kind of like a limiting factor on something which you know, approximates it. Um, in order to give someone else their freedom. Um, and that freedom is not something that they can take. They might not have the power to take it anymore. They may have been so downtrodden that they can't take it. They need to be given it. And they can be given it in the same way that God gave up his freedom. We renounce, we renounce the idea that we're all a totality. And then we give that freedom to the other in the same way that God gave freedom to human beings through an abdication, basically. Um, and, you know, there is, you know, whilst human beings are alive, God is limited. You know, God is, is fallible. God is um, full of sin. Because we are full of sin, apparently. So you have this very, you know, fallible God that you end up with after, after creation. As, as far as I, you know, that, you know, insofar as I read that, you know, I mean, there, there are probably people who would disagree with that, but that's how I kind of read it. Perfect. And then divides himself into a, into a number of human beings and therefore becomes corrupted by doing that. Um, I mean, they never puts it in those terms, um, but there's a sense in which that gives, maybe that gives the kind of listeners a, a broad idea of what's happening in the decreative act. The decreative act is that kind of abdication of totality in order to give to, uh, to someone else the, the possibility of being, the possibility of freedom. Yeah. Um, it's not that you have an absolute God who can create this separate thing, which is human beings. He has to kind of renounce himself in many ways. That's all he has. You know, he, he only has being. Why? an attentive relationship to the other is our, ourselves giving being to the other and, and trying to work out how we can do that in a material sense. So it's a mirror, it's a mirror relationship then. The God-human relationship is the same as the human-human relationship. Yeah, it is. But I also realise how that's fairly contradictory to what I said earlier about faith Christianity being incarnated and that Christ provides the... I mean... In many ways, in many ways, Christ also gives up his being for humanity as well, which is what you know Harry also said. Um, so there is just a continuous process of of giving up being for the other, which we get in God's ultimate act of creation, which we get in God incarnated in Christ's crucifixion, and then which we get in Vey's um, ethical uh, imperative that we, you know, give ourselves up and evacuate ourselves for for the good and for the other. Yeah, and then, yeah, if you think of it through the kind of, I mean, I, I see more of a similarity between Vey and Spinoza than I do with her and any other philosopher, but I think that's because of my own um, holistic things that I put on things, and I think her philosophy is very holistic. And in that case, when she's kind of talking about, you know, sacrificing, which you are doing, people are sacrificing their own form of being to enable other people's forms of being, you're not really sacrificing anything because you you are all of the same being. Mm, mm, absolutely. I, th I, think, I think you're right. I, th I think there's, a, there's, you know, I think what, what you think you are sacrificing isn't, doesn't have any value anyway. It's the person. It's, it's the kind of the opinions and beliefs that kind of get stuck on you um, from society anyway. Um, and so they have no real value in many ways. Um, and so giving them up, I mean, 
it, it, it isn't isn't shouldn't be particularly stressful even though it is for us because it's very hard we're very attached to these things right we have an imaginary idea of ourselves whereas really we're just an accumulation of social and historical conventions um so giving up feels like we're giving up something quite radical but actually we're not but what we get from giving them up is a relationship to the other which is properly nourishing which is which is proper properly what it is about to be a, a human being you know so you, you gain more than you um more than you give up in many ways if uh, if god's infinite couldn't god if god is infinite being couldn't you be divided an infinite number of times without being reduced in size yeah it's yeah you know these these are these are difficulties of phase creation theology that are perhaps not worked out in detail um you know they the thing is one has to read people in the history of philosophy very charitably if you know i remember my supervisor once saying to me so if you ever see a problem in spinoza the first thing you have to ask yourself is there's a problem with the way i'm thinking it's not a problem with the figure in the history of philosophy and a lot of people don't like that but i think it shows kind of humility um and we know that they that they's understanding of mathematics is very very good her brother andre they is a very famous mathematician in the history of mathematics and they's notebooks are filled i don't know if i can just maybe pick a page that has them on are filled with the most obscure algebraic and geometric reasonings and workings out and things like this and uh i can't see any right now but they're all in there they're, they're all in here so you know they would have understood you know her theories of infinity and of course she would have understood the the theories of god's relationship to infinity and the absolute um and yet nevertheless felt that it was felt that it was you know a theory which you know worked for her so but i'll give Faye the benefit of the doubt that she had thought about that and nevertheless wrote it down sure. it's a bit of a cop-out but <laughs> well, yeah i mean uh, and again um, god doesn't necessarily need to be infinite to be a god like you can still be like a divine creator yet you don't have to be be super powerful and stuff but you don't necessarily have to be infinite like you can appear godlike but you can still be finite um would that be a more accurate like you know like rendition of veils god that fits more in line with her philosophy um i don't think that god uh, i i'm going to pick up on one word you, you said there you said that god might appear infinite uh, well, for they, and I quote her now from the notebooks, appearance chains being down. She says, appearance chains being down. We are appearance. We're the shadows on the cave in Plato's allegory of the cave. And there's a sense in which we chain God as absolute being down. Mm -hmm. um, and what we're doing when we decreate and when we attend is a, ren is a, is a, is a renunciation of appearance mm -hmm. um, in order to get to being as such. Um, so I don't think she would say that there is anything uh, a pa um, that resembles mere appearance in God. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if I can answer this any more in any more detail, actually. I'm curious. Um, you said that everything, she was saying like the humans are the shadows of the case. So everything is as it appears. Is that what he's basically saying? uh well they, you know they thinks that we're you know we're born into ignorance in in, in many ways i mean play uses the allegory of the cave quite often to describe the human condition mm -hmm. um of course with the allegory of the cave everything is a shadow in the cave apart from the human beings who perceive the shadows mm -hmm. but they goes one step further and perhaps suggests that even the human beings are shadows um and that they become filled out as it were in their kind of uh, movement towards the good movement towards the truth um, so yeah, you know she's a Platonist, so you can you can think about a lot of her structures through that allegory. Shadows of God. Yeah, in many ways, shadows of God. Yeah, that's a good that's a good way of thinking about it. And we need to fill out those shadows to become more and more like God through His act of creation, which is that decreative act. So, like, if we completed that project, what would it look like? 
and God good. returned to his fullness. Like. Yeah. I, again, I think it's a process. I don't think there's an end point at which that will ever happen. Um, I think it's something which is uh, used. It's an ethical imperative which guides human life. Um, I don't think they ever thinks that it can happen. You, um, I'm curious, could you like, you know, interpret they through, like they's like, you know, assessment of the human condition through Heraclitus's doctrine that everything has changed, that humans are constantly you know, changing and, and stuff, like constantly uh, trying to, you know, develop in that fashion. Mm, yeah, and you know, and this, I mean, they, the Platonists, would obviously, you know, prioritize being over becoming. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you know, would not be Her Heracletian particularly. And yet I have talked about process a lot. Um, and, you know, for they, truth is a process in, in the way that we're always moving. You can only ever move towards truth. You can't really ever grasp it. But that's the same as what, you know, Socrates says in, in, in the Apology. You know, it's the, the paradox of Socratic wisdom is that we never really get there. You know, we're always left with aporia. We're always left with confusion. And it's actually a movement towards truth that we should cultivate rather than any, in any belief that we can actually have truth in, like, as, as some sort of object that we can possess and that we can have propositional clarity about. It doesn't really, I don't think for they, that's there. So there is an element of Heracletian becoming in there, but not in terms of being, in, in terms of any epistemology. Um, just in terms of the, the piece again, uh, silence is violence. Um, I'm because they is massively contradictory. We, I think this is <laughs> established that. But you kind you you take her kind of idea of contradiction in the piece, and that's how you're trying to approach, you know, these two things that seem to be posed against each other. And it's unclear to me in terms of that whether what they think contradiction is is contradiction working especially with the kind of notion of social injustice is it necessity that there must be contradiction in order to highlight the opposition's features or is it that contradiction is it doesn't exist it, it's an idea that needs to be dissolved things just are mm -hmm. Th this is a question which you, you sent me before and uh, and I've written as, as a note, this is a great question and one which I don't think I have a straight answer to. <laughs> it's a really, really good and really difficult question. And it's something that I'm struggling with at the moment in the, um, in the article I'm writing. Um, they says contradictions point to the real. Um, and this obviously goes against the traditional way of thinking about contradiction. When we think about contradiction, we think about something we say, okay, well, we've, we've, we've got a problem here. Let's try and solve it and get to the real. It's only, be, you know, it's only beyond the contradiction the real emerges because contradiction can't obtain. Um, but they says, no, when we meet a contradiction, we come into contact with the real. Um, to dissolve a contradiction would be to dissolve the real. It would be to, it would be to, tr um, it would be to try and give propositional clarity to something which doesn't necessarily, or which doesn't function on, in those terms. And it's only the mind that, the, 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 the mind of the imagination, the mind of the intellect, the human person that demands it to have propositional clarity. Um, and contradiction, because it points to the real, it is also paves the way for thinking as such. You know, they doesn't think that we think when we get hold of a truth that's certain and we can kind of like store that truth somewhere down here. She thinks that truth needs to uh, activate us. Um, and there's a sense in which contradiction does that. Contradiction um, activates us and forces us to thought. Um, and it also uh, allows ideas not to become, um, uh, not to become static and not to become idols because as soon as you have a truth that is static and you can kind of take it around and you but and you believe in it fully it, bec it, it becomes an idol and once it's an idol it becomes a uh, uh 
you become completely blind to everything else. Um, they also think that when you have complete propositional clarity about something, you can't see the truth anymore. It becomes so transparent, you see through it. So it becomes pointless. Truth is like a knot which activates thinking in the same way. If we have a knot, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to un unpack it and in unpacking it, we're, we're involved in, in, in the process of thought, um, thought proper. So the contradiction is real. The contradiction points to the real. Um, contradiction isn't necessary in every, you know, it's, it's not that every form of injustice will be, will be, um, will come along with a, with a contradiction. Um, but in this instance, it's one, it's one way of thinking about the contradiction that we come up against. Um, and also thinking about the impossibility of the good action and the just action as well. Because it's only if the good action is impossible that we can constantly try to act in the good way. Because as soon as we think we've acted in a good way, we stop acting good in many ways. If we think it's impossible, we constantly keep acting and trying to approximate the good. Again, that, like I said, no straight answer. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's interesting. Um, it's, com it's confusing. It's confusing stuff. Um, but at the same time, I feel like you can really tell she read Kant um, when it comes to that kind of stuff, particularly. I mean, I know when I originally sent the question, um, I was sort of working along the lines of the first critique and you in, in your other piece, it's the third critique that you sort of say, oh, well, actually, that's where, you know, you can see you can see the camp thread in there so you can tell she was a head reader i mean i guess on that i will i will ask that um do you think that there is some some kantian ideas from the third critique especially with the ideas of attention and contradiction though i, I think i think that first of all i think there's probably lots of ideas from the first critique that are in vague they the can you know they they cite kant uh, in her intellectual biography um there are lots of ideas in there that would be from the first critique, but you know, I'm going to be completely honest with, with you guys. I don't know the third critique particularly well. You know, I don't know, and I do not have time to go and read and study the or all the desire or the will at the minute. So, you know, you you you, you, you choose your blind spots, and in many ways, Kant's first critique is a, is a blind spot um, for me. I'm happy to admit that. That's fine. Um, uh, but the third critique, on the other hand, I do know, um, and for me. You know, Vey's, what we don't, we don't have much work from Vey, but what we do have is we have a series of notes from when she was a philosophy lecturer um, from her students that have been collected in a book called Lectures on Philosophy. Um, and in Lectures on Philosophy, there's all these notes from Vey's classes. Um, and there are a series of notes on aesthetics uh, and where Vey gives a, basically a, a verbatim um, development of aesthetics as it is given in the critique. So we know that she has this Kantian, so we know that she knows the third critique, we know that it's there. Um, but I also think that Faye's concept of um, attention is underwritten, and you'll see this in the article I published last year, is underwritten by the Kantian concept of disinterestedness, aesthetic disinterestedness, which for Kant is kind of like that relation that we have to something which is beyond uh, what he calls the good and the agreeable, i.e. that which doesn't involve any personal interest and which is driven by what he calls a purposeness without purpose, which is kind of, so it's kind of a teleological judgment, but without that telos being directed towards anything determinate. And in many ways, this is what we get in Bayes' concept of attention. We get a relation of disinterestedness towards the object of attention, such that we can be directed towards something without that direction being driven by interests that arise from our personality. Um, and this means that we can have this disinterested relationship with the object of injustice and allow them to emerge on their own terms in the same way that for Kant, the beautiful emerges through an object of disinterestedness. So I, 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 I see they uh, I see that kind of I see that relation between the third critique and 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 Bay's work, and I think it's quite strong. And, and you know, I I argue for that in that in that article that I published last year. And um, I'm yet to really I mean I've presented it a couple of times, but I'm yet to really hear anyone that's pushed back on it. So I think that it's fairly convincing in some ways. <laughs>
Um, no, it, that's it's super interesting, and I, it's interesting for me because when I first read Attention, um, instantly what I got was, oh, that's a Kantian vibe, but a first critique um, sort of concepts and you know rhapsody of sensation Kantian vibe. Mm. And then you've read it and you've said, oh yeah, that's definitely Kantian, but it's you know it's this form of Kantian, so it's mm. definitely there. I don't think you will get much mm. much pushback on that. Well, it's nice to nice to hear that, and you know, and th 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 there will be, you know, there there is work to be done on on Kant and the on Vey and the, the influence of the, of the first critique, and there is some work out there already, um, but it's something which I I don't think I have the uh, uh, knowledge to do properly, so I will uh, just continue to talk about the third critique. <laughs> Fair enough. So yeah. Harris, Aram. I mean, this may be off topic, um, but I'm curious about um, Vey's, like, because doesn't he say that um, force is, like, the driving, like, thing, like, what drives history? So he, he say that, because, like, you know, like Marx says, class is what drives, like, the progress of history. Some Vey will say it's force, and by that, what does he mean by force? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, Vey has an, an essay called... Um, the Iliad or the poem of force. And she reads the Iliad as, uh, as a meditation on, <clears throat> on force. <clears throat> what does she mean by force? Um, material conditions. So again, Marx, but you know, uh, the material conditions of necessity, the, the, the material conditions which drive everything, but which can't be limited to class structures alone. I have a chip on my shoulder about class. I'm a Marxist and so far as I'm not very good of an, of a, of an intersectional thinker on these things. I, you know, I think it's class is the driver of, of yeah. most of them. I'm going to get shot for that. Um, but, you know, that's just my working class chip on my shoulder. Uh, but they, I think, in talking about force, she opens it up to other um, material processes which have an intersect, which have the possibility for intersectional um, analysis, you know, you can include forces of, of, of gender, race, um, etc. Okay, yeah, it's still along the Marxist line, sorry, of Aram. It's just, you, you said earlier that they was quite critical of Marxism. Is it because Marxism takes a less intersectional approach, or at least it would have done? No, I don't think it's because of that. Um, I think it's because it becomes a worldview her and as soon as it becomes a worldview it appeals to the collective and as they says the we is infinitely more dangerous than the i um, so i think the very fact that the truth that marxism harbors become idols uh, they become dogmatic and they become things by which truths by which people die for essentially and therefore you know do not necessarily have the same force of truth as what as what they want to talk about. You know, in, in, in the collected essays, Oppression and Liberty, there's lots of um, essays on uh, her critique of, of, of Marxism, uh, her problematic relationship to communism and so on and so forth. But of course, you know, they was, was in a very good place to, to make those criticisms. She would, for instance, apparently she was the only person who was able to hold her own in an argument with Trotsky. And Trotsky would, would regularly stay at her parents' house in Paris, and she would just argue and argue and argue <laughs> with him. Um, so, uh, you know, her relationship is, is fractured, um, but nevertheless, she is still interested in the fundamental things that Marx is interested in. Uh, oppression, affliction, history, movements of history, labour, you know, labour is absolutely key for they as well. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting relationship. But, uh, before we go, um, is there anything you'd like to plug, Christopher? Uh, anything for the people? Uh, I think I'd like to plug. Well, if you haven't read the article uh, on the Philosophical Salon, I'm sure these guys will post it in the um, in the comments or, or, the, or, the, or the section or whatever. Um, if you're interested in anything that I said before, you can read my previous article on on Ve, which came out last year. Um, more articles to come, hopefully, and a, and a monograph. Um, but before that, we've got the um, fingers crossed that we get the grant for the uh, Simon Vey in the 21st century. And if, if that happens, I'll come back to you guys and you can promote it somehow. Sounds good.
Uh, thanks for being on the podcast. It's been very informative. Great. Well, thank you for having me. There were great questions. Thank you, man. Like, um, take care and peace out. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.